All right, guys, welcome back to another episode of Coffee and Van Chats. I'm sitting here with Cody Townsend, who's a professional skier and honestly, I think a professional adventure man. Uh, usually on this podcast, we have we have cyclists and and whatever else, but I, I just got done watching his, his documentary where he pretty much rode up the coast uh, from California to Oregon and just started skiing, hiking up mountains and skiing down these mountains. So not only did he bike pack there, but he hiked up these mountains. And so, Cody, how you doing, man? I'm doing good. I think I'm finally recovered from that mission. It took yeah. me a, took me a while actually. Yeah, yeah. You you rode back, right? No, I did <laughs> not ride back. That yeah. was one of the things I've kind of learned from a lot of bike packing adventures and doing research is the dirty secret is no one rides back home because no uh, you put so much effort into just getting up there that it's like there's no way I'm going to turn around and take another month to ride home. So yeah, uh, yeah no, we uh, loaded back up into trucks and drove home. Yeah, and so that was that was your first bike packing adventure, huh? And so yeah, that definitely was. And bef- before we dive into a little bit about who you are, let, what's one tip that you would give a bike packer that's just getting started that you wish you would have known? Like one thing that you wish you would have had, or like one thing that you wish you would have read about bike packing? Because you can read so much, and then you get out there, and you're like, "Damn it." If only I yeah, had mine was this. actually um, a piece of advice that I followed before I went out on the trip that Michelle didn't follow. And it's brought up in the movie. And yeah. I think it was the single best piece of advice um, that kind of saved me and made it harder on Michelle was uh, getting a smaller front cassette, um, ah. going downsizing on the cassette. Yeah. So I was able to spin because our bikes, you know, were between 90 to a hundred pounds and grinding up hills and just being able to spin up the hills was unbelievable difference between having to you know stand up into your pedals and start grinding that way so you're able to uh, achieve achieve some pretty big energy conservation with uh, yeah. some lower gearing and uh, I think that was like the best piece of advice I actually followed um, as far as other things you know like we we had such a unique trip because we were what I've mainly seen with a lot of bike packing trips is you're you're utilizing uh, restaurants, hotels, cafes, um, gas stations, all that stuff. To, so you don't have to bring a ton of food. And uh, we weren't doing that. And mm-hmm. so that made it definitely a little more difficult. Um, if I were to do it again, I would definitely want the non-pandemic conditions yeah. where you could maybe stop and take a shower or, uh, yeah. you know, pick up some dinner that you didn't bring yourself or something like that. So Some space um, food. Yeah. And it's also, I guess, just, you know, it was amazing to be kind of off the grid and be camping the whole time and just be like a little away from people. Um, I think that lended a uniqueness to the trip that you don't quite get in a lot of adventures, but there was also something to be said for, you know, getting a feel for a town and going into a cafe and just kind of like stopping through certain areas as opposed to pretty much all population centers because, you know, this happened in May of last year or this, yeah, last year, 2020, we were being very cognizant of to not stop into small towns along the way. We didn't want to. Yeah. Cause it was still, it was still kind of fresh then. Yeah, it was fresh. Like we, we were following all the rules. We, the stay at home orders had lifted for all the States we were going through. Um, but travel was still kind of a little weary. So we were trying to be respectful and, uh, and definitely, yeah, it was still fresh and we didn't want to be doing anything that, you know, small towns might not appreciate and that we could put other people in danger. No, for sure. Yeah. I mean, just watching most of your videos, you're pretty much to yourself anyway, because people think you're nuts. And so you're, you're pretty much climbing up these mountains by yourself anyway. So yeah, man, well, let's dive into a little bit about you. Like I said, this is, you're the first non-cyclist I've had on this podcast, which is hard to call you non-cyclist being that you've just pretty much rode about as much in a month as some people do in a year. Um, so yeah, so tell us a bit about you. Where does it all get started? How did you get into skiing and how did you end up doing these crazy adventures? Yeah. So I pretty much from as young as I can remember was obsessed with skiing in the mountains, which was a bit different from where I grew up because I grew up in Santa Cruz, California. So I was yeah. a, I was a beach kid growing up. Uh, my parents had a little cabin up in the mountains in Tahoe, um, just outside of Squaw Valley. And we'd go up on the weekends. And I mean, I decided when I was six years old, I knew what I was going to do with my life. And that was to be a skier. I didn't know how, you know, most kids dream of being like an astronaut or something. And I was like, 
I'm a skier. That's what yeah. it's going to be. And, um, you know, made my way through the ranks, was a competitive Alpine ski racer for until I was about 20, kind of making the, the, trying to chase the dream of going to the Olympics, uh, just like you uh, have and once had. And um, kind of got burnt out on the, the ski racing scene. Um, meanwhile, the free ride movement in skiing was absolutely burgeoning in like the early 2000s and it was burgeoning in my backyard being Squaw Valley. That was like where all the superstars lived and where the most progression was happening and it was just like the heroes of the sport were all based there and I was a young kid growing up watching it and then started tagging along with all those guys and made a transition from racing into free skiing and um, yeah now it's been I'm you know, when I was about 20 is kind of when I quit and now I'm 37. So I've been a professional skier. I mean, I was a sponsored ski racer. So it's been over 20 years of being a sponsored and professional skier. And wow. I still kind of count that as my number one accomplishment in life of, you know, it's not any one thing. It's just the fact that like, I've been able to make a career out of the thing I love most. Yeah. Yeah. So still chasing the dream. Yeah. And that kind of dives us into the 50 project, which I, you know, I found over quarantine. I think a lot of people picked up some new hobbies. I, I'm a new, new skier myself. And so like, I, I just trying to learn everything I can being an athletic guy and being competitive, you know, it's like, you, you kind of want to pick up where you left off in your past sport and just try to bring it over, which it, does, it never works that way, but, but you want to know, and you want to know what you're doing. And so I've been watching videos of you and the 50 projects. So tell us a little bit about the 50 project and, and why it's so unique and uh, yeah, where it all comes from. Yeah. So the 50 it's, um, the the basis of it is there's this book called the 50 classic ski descents of north america and it was based off a legendary climbing book like rock climbing book called the 50 classic climbs of north america and so they um, three authors came together and made it the book about 10 years ago and it's a beautiful coffee table book and um, it's just kind of like a tribute to some of the most uh, amazing and badass mountains throughout north america so spread out from the east coast to canada to alaska all over the West Coast, every kind of Western state has some representation of like one of the, the classic lines in that area. And um, I was looking at this book, you know, I picked it up when it was fresh off the printing press. And to me, when at that point in my career, it didn't necessarily speak to me. I was just like, wow, it's a beautiful, cool book. Yeah. And then as my skiing kind of started to evolve and, um, you know, being a professional skier, I was filming in ski movies and doing the kind of normal thing of hucking backflips off big cliffs and skiing gnarly lines, using helicopters and mechanized access to get to a lot of these, these places and mountains. And I slowly started to kind of fall in love with the, the human powered side of, of of, of skiing and um, getting to the top of the exact same lines I was free ride skiing, but doing it under your own power. And all of a sudden the book spoke to me in a different way. And I started looking at that book as not something that was just a coffee table adornment and a beautiful tribute, but like something that was like, mate, I kind of want to ski a lot of these lines. And most of the lines are um, human powered access only. They're of the ski mountaineering variety. Um, you know, you have the Grand Teton and some classic kind of climbing skiing adventures in there. And uh, I started dreaming like one or two of them. And I was like, okay, like three or four. And I just yeah. started putting more and more lines on the bucket list. Till I was like, wait, I should just try and ski all of them. And <laughs> kind of like asked around and people were like, yeah, no, no one's done that. Um, all the lines in the book have been skied at least once um, yeah. by somebody, but no one has tried to ski them all um, or has skied them all. So I was like, well, here's a new goal. Here's a new, yeah. new adventure. And it was a thing that was inspiring me most at that time in my life before I started this. And I had kind of, again, got a little burnout with the, the free skiing side of things, the kind of filming and I'd done it for so long. I kind of achieved every goal I'd want to achieve in that, in that realm of the sport. And, um, all of a sudden just this kind of took my took my grasp and i again got to this point where it was like if i don't try this i'm going to regret it for the rest of my life so sure. at that moment i knew i had to at least try and um yeah now we are 
a couple years in on the project. I've got 30 of the lines done with. And wow. along the way, I'm producing a web series um, called The 50 that's on YouTube that's just kind of following along the, the adventure. And every line has its own episode. And we do a lot of stuff of like, it's not just ski porn. It's not just skiing. Um, it's everything that goes into kind of these adventures. Um, you know, I say it's 80% not skiing is the, the kind of format of the episodes like it's all the decision making all the planning all the logistics all the like trying to make safe decisions and moving through dangerous environments and um, making these calls to get to these places so it's a it's kind of become very relatable for a lot of people because it's not yeah. just skiing it's like kind of a human story of going through this all and um yeah it's been doing really well people seem to love it and it's been awesome because it's just kind of funding my way to to continue to do this project and do what uh, you love yeah, yeah now i got 20 lines left and it's only going to get harder from here yeah you think so how much how much more time do you think or like are you are you on a projected like I got to be done by like, let's say 2024, like you on a timeline or are you kind of just like, ah, if we can make it work, we can make it work. Cause I'm assuming COVID had to throw a wrench in this plan. Cause yeah. So when I first set out, I said I was going to try and do it in three years, which was mm -hmm. absurd because it's yeah. like, no one's even done this. And you're saying you're going to do it in three years. And yeah. it was a little bit of a kind of, it was honestly, you know, a challenge for myself because one of the things was I knew I could get distracted by a lot of other things and I wanted my entire life focus and ski focus to be on this project. And I also was like, kind of wanted that challenge of like taking offline line after line and see if I could potentially do it. I knew the possibility of doing was almost slim to none. And one little thing in there could could make that not possible in three years. That happened to be definitely COVID this year and that yeah. definitely threw a wrench in it. Um, unfortunately too, in ski mountaineering, a majority of the lines come into form and in safe form, um, meaning there's less avalanche conditions typically in the spring. So you're looking at like late March, April and early May as your kind of window for quite a lot of the lines. So missing out in a spring last year has definitely pushed that three-year goal pretty much completely impossible. Yeah. That being said too, I tell people, I'm like, well, it's probably going to take two more years to 20 more years yeah. because there are three lines in the book that I call the crux lines and they are the most challenging the gnarliest and hardest lines in the book. Um, they've been skied once or twice in 25, 30 years, and they might only come into condition, safe form and skiable form once every 10 to 20 years. And you gotta be there on that day. So for me, it's like, I'm gonna continue to whittle away at this and I'm gonna put more and more focus onto these crux lines. And it may take 10 attempts to get, get it done. And I don't even know if I'll get to some of them and just be like, you know what, this line is way too dangerous for me. Like it's maybe changed since it's first skied because of climate change, because these lines are evaporating pretty quickly. Um, maybe it's just feeling like, you know what, the risk of the risk on this line is just not worth completing it. And I'm going to stop at 49. And then, you know, these were all things I had to kind of think about before I was getting into the project because Ultimately, it's a really, really dangerous project. You know, I had a lot of close friends and mentors to me tell me like, kind of like, Dude, this is burly, really, really yeah. burly. And I had to give that a lot of thought and get really comfortable with pulling out of the entire project at some point because I can't get one line done because I just feel like the risk is too high. So yeah, it's uh, like I said, so I think two to 20 years or never, you know, that's, well, yeah. that, that's kind of the way I roll with it. The crazy part is, is I think one of the video, the first video I ever watched of you, you were, I think you were in Alaska and you guys bailed on a line. Like one of the first, first videos I watched, it was just like, Hey, and I think you ended up coming back to this specific line and completing it. I don't know if you know which one I'm talking about. I can't think of it off the top of my head, but it was like a, a solid moment there. Like, do we keep going? And you guys did pretty much like a three minute segment of how Hey, if it's not good, we bail out. So how do you guys know that? Like, because like, I mean, you know, a guy like me, it's not like, like I can see the roads out here. It's like, if there's ice on the ground, I don't usually go ride, you know, like I'm going to slide out, injure myself, whatever, but I can also gauge it. But 
you're talking about lines that are way, way far away from you. How are you, how are you knowing that the conditions are right? Or is it just like, Hey, we pack up, we go, we see if it's not, it's not. Well, the good thing is my experience as a skier and specifically in North America and Western North America has led me a lot of knowledge of to when these lines are potentially in. Um, okay. I also have a huge network of friends and community members that are helping me keep informed on local conditions. And that's been um, unbelievably useful. And just uh, so I've, I mean, I've had friends out of the blue uh, text me and be like, Hey, Alaska's in you got to get up here and then I'll try and do my research and figure it out and be like, okay, I think it could be good. Um, but like you said, like in Alaska, that was a Sphinx in the pontoon. Um, we had reports that was most likely doable and we flew all the way up there. We set out on the mission and got 400 feet from the top and felt like it was too dangerous to keep going. And in those moments, like those decisions are actually kind of easy. I think, um, you're obviously seeing potential sides signs that like, Hey, this is getting a little sketchy. And yeah. you know, the, the risk here is really, really high. We're in fall, you die terrain and whatever kind of hazards we're seeing, whether it's avalanche or whether it's ice or whether it's exposure, um, loose snow, just weird things that we're seeing, or just a gut feeling like this is just too much that we want to deal with right now. Those decisions, like you're kind of, you're, life is on the line for sure that i find it to be like pretty easy decision to turn around um it's generally after when you're kind of then questioning it being like should we have turned around uh, we could have we have done it and then you then you go through a lot of mental battles in in that realm um but generally i try and celebrate turning around and in ski mountaineering if you're not turning around from peaks you're definitely doing something wrong because yeah um the, the days that you need to do these lines, especially these dangerous lines, uh, they only come in a few times a year or once a year or once every five years at that. So to get uh, to get there and to turn around, that's just all part of the, the process. And we're trying to make safe decisions through this whole way. Um, you know, I always tell people there's three priorities to this project. Um, priority number one is don't die. Priority number two is have fun. And priority yeah. number three is ski all 50. Yeah. And if any of those first two rules look like they're going to interfere with trying to ski all the 50, then, then I stop. Um, yeah. because again, it's a pretty, pretty dangerous project. For sure. For sure. So, you know, you know, diving, diving out of that and, and, you know, a little bit into the podcast, you know, we're called coffee and van chats. You know, we, we bring people on that have vans or coffee, whatever. And I, I did a little bit of research and you have a Ford Ranger that's tent ready, camp ready. Um, have you done any exploring in that? Um, oh yeah, this year? Uh, that thing that was my kind of that was my uh, vehicle last year, and um, it's just a perfect little off-road vehicle. Like we, where I live in Lake Tahoe, and we have this the zone called the East Side, which is um, you know the Southern Sierra, kind of near Mammoth in that zone, and we do a pretty a lot of gnarly dirt roads to access snow lines and whatnot. Yeah. And there's like practically rock crawling to get up to some of the, you know, to the snow line and whatnot. For so sure. that little little Ford with uh, the camper on the back. It was just a perfect little, little vehicle to, to scope, um, scope lines from, to get to lines, camp out at the trailhead the night before. Um, yeah, it's awesome. Right on, right on. So, and what's it built out with? So it's built with, it's got a, it's got a roof, roof tent. And then did you, you built out the entirety of the back, right? Yeah. So it's a, it's a Ford Ranger. I put a lift on it. I put some BFG KO2s, bigger tires on it, um, yeah, put a right suspension on. upgrade. And then uh, the camper on the back is called a GFC, a go fast camper. Mm -hmm. uh, they're a camper company out of Bozeman, Montana, and they manufacture them in Bozeman. And it's kind of this, like, it's like a camper shell, but then the camper shell pops up into a tent and you sleep on the upper deck and then underneath it yeah i ended up building out my kind of my sliding drawer system and this kind of like make it so it's livable i mean it's a small living space it's yeah. you know a five foot bed yeah, and sure. uh I, you know but i managed to fit all my gear in there and can live out of it and it's pretty awesome because it's like very minimalist but it's a lightweight easy kind of uh, adventure vehicle no, yeah, that's awesome, man. So, so what's what's next for you on the docket? Like, you know, with hopefully with this vaccine and everything that's coming out, we're not going to dive too deep into politics on the vaccine, but hopefully we see a sense of normalcy soon. What what's next for you? Let's say 
you know, let's say by March things are normal or things are looking to become somewhat more normal. What's what's next for you on the projects? Well, we I do plan on continuing the project this year. Yeah. Um, we have seven lines left in like the continental United States and then a lot of lines in Canada, which there is definitely some hurdles to get into Canada right now since the For border sure. is, is closed. But, um, you know, considering the name of this, uh, this podcast, I actually do have a van being built right now. Oh. Um, I'm picking it up in about a week. Awesome. And the good thing about what this project does is it's all backcountry and yeah. We're pretty self-sustaining and contained. So it's, and I keep saying we, but it's my myself and the principal cinematographer, who is yeah. pretty much my backcountry partner for it, Bjarne Salen. And he has a van that he has built out himself. Um, he's actually building his third van right now. It's almost finished as well. And so one of the benefits of our project is we're going to be able to, whether that's, it's just gas stations and grocery stores, which we all kind of do normally around our own neighborhoods, is other than stopping in there, we're pretty self-contained. We'll be able to live out of our vans, be camping at trailheads, and uh, going out in the backcountry away from people to continue with this project. So you know, talking with people, talking with sponsors, talking with uh, locals, like everyone feels like it's pretty acceptable to do that. And we're going to obey our best practices for sure to make sure that we're traveling safely, just like we did for, for the, the bike trip. But um, I think we're going to be able to continue. Um, we are going to probably start in about middle of February, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, right now, uh, across the West, the avalanche conditions are really, really dangerous. Um, there's pretty weird snow, low snow everywhere. So we're looking to start a little bit later this year for the hunt on the rest of the lines and, um, really ramp up towards the spring. So March, April, and May, and, um, maybe hopefully, yeah, we can get into Canada too. That would be awesome. And, uh, yeah. get up there and you know, hopefully we get back to some sort of normalcy soon. I think, I think all of us, regardless of, any sort of politics are just tired of this. Yes. We're just over yes. it. We just yes. want, we're like, come on, let's just, this is brutal. Um, but, um, you know, we're still going to obey all rules and make sure that we're doing it safely. But we're, yeah, you know. I think it's one of those things where it's just like, if we can just ride it out together, you know, that's how we get back to this quicker, in my opinion. Yeah. And, and that's, and that's that, no matter what you believe, if we're just in it together, you know, this, that's how we get out of this quicker, in my opinion. And, and, uh, but yeah, man, that, that's, that's insane. And so with, with that all being said, it's, uh, are those gnarly lines that you were talking about in the beginning that could be anywhere from 10 to 15 years, are those in Canada? Um, actually, no, the, there, there is one, oh, well, there's one in Canada, Mount Robson. Mm -hmm. Um, that's only been skied twice in history. Um, it's the biggest peak in the Rocky, the Canadian Rockies, and it's a uh, pretty, it's a peak of lore. It's got a lot of legends about it. Um, a yeah. lot of crazy stories from it. It's a pretty alpine climbing uh, classic line. And uh, but then the other two are up in Alaska, University Peak and Mount St. Elias. Um, so those kind of those crux lines, they, they deserve a lot of time to them. They're going to take, uh, you know, like regardless of it takes years, it's going to take a month just being at the base of them and learning the lines and um, figuring out the conditions, waiting for the right conditions preparing yourself for them because uh the climbs on them are all very burly um they are very exposed um you know there's been fatalities associated with all three of them so they're on the danger scale so i want to invest my time and effort into it um so like this year again we're going to kind of continue to work on what i would call the easier ones but they're not necessarily easy by any yeah. means they're definitely still on the hard side of things but focus on those and start to uh work my way towards giving all the time and energy for those last three um yeah well besides the bike packing trip i mean the way these videos seem and it, you know credit to your videographer as well as the the editing that goes into this i mean it literally seems like you wake up you yawn you stretch you get out of bed you you walk to the base or you get to your airbnb or whatever and then you hike up this thing and you ski down it so what i'm hearing though is that like is there like a few days that goes into going like okay we're here at the airbnb let's check some condition schedules let's check what day is going to be the best climbing routes things like that on average how many days does it take for you to do one of these lines 
Uh, I would say it takes at least a week to a week and a half. And that's in like perfect style uh, scenario. So like our kind of habit, um, I always say we're working on three lines at once. Um, mm -hmm. I'm always, every day I can I check the avalanche forecast for all of Western North America and Canada. So I look and see where there's trends of stabilization um, and start to narrow in my focus. Um, then I'll compare that with the weather trends and see like, hey, is there uh, good weather in Idaho right now because there's stabilization happening and so I'm starting to like look outward um, while I'm maybe let's say in Wyoming skiing a line right there and starting to forecast like okay when we get done with this maybe we're going to Idaho maybe we're going to Oregon I don't know but we kind of keep our eyes open um, and then like let's say I get done then I'm like calling people calling friends um, in that area trying to source as much local beta as possible to get the confidence to pull the trigger and drive you know whether it's a thousand miles to get there drive to it and then usually when we're in the place I would say it's at least um, three days there like I like to show up do some sort of scout get a lay of the land day the day before we go out um, kind of build on that beta maybe go for a, a snow check or a tour, maybe just kind of wait and relax and uh, do more research to feel like if it's, uh, it's good to go. And then, and then we do it. So yeah, these kind of lines. And I think backcountry skiing in particular takes a, it takes a lot of time. Um, you yeah. want to be um, very uh, cognizant of all the dangers and all the, the hazards out there, the avalanche conditions, the weather conditions, and making sure that you're well researched before heading out there. So, and we try and, you know, we try and share that in this, uh, in the episodes and not all of them have that kind of story but we definitely talk about that um quite often of just like we're going here because this is what we're hearing is good and we'll you know drive from california to utah at the the drop of a dime but you know it's the drop of a dime but with all with a lot of research backing it yeah and so with all this kind of like coming into some like in, like all this time coming into something do you have like any superstitious things that you like do you have to wear a certain pair of socks do you have to like have a certain breakfast like is there any like superstitious things that you have before the these one lines? thing i have is that i gotta put on my left sock and left boot on first before my right and there's really? times when and it's just a weird thing and it's just like i've actually done that where if i'm like pretty out of it in the morning and tired or something and i'll like throw on my right sock first then i go okay you're not paying attention and it's my first oh, wow. key to like you're tired you're in a different space you're okay like Today for a split gonna, second, I thought you were just screwing with me. I was just like, oh man, maybe that was a dumb question. But yeah, so this no. seriously is, yeah. Yeah, it seriously yeah. is. And it's a, it's kind of a good check for me, like to be like, uh, if I happen to, I mean, there's plenty of other self checks I do with myself, yeah, but yeah. if I happen to do that, put my right foot in my boot first or my right sock on first, then I know I'm not quite there and maybe not necessarily seeing all the signs or um, thinking straight that day. And then I have to adjust appropriately from there. So that, that's one little thing. I don't have a ton of superstitions. I did yeah. more when I was younger, but that's one thing I still kind of hold on to. No, that's pretty cool. That's, that's funny. So one last question before I let you go. Um, we ask everybody on this podcast, this Coffee Vanchez podcast, and uh, this is this one is, is kind of always interesting to hear what people would say, but if you could have coffee with one person dead or alive, who would that person be and why? And then how would you take your coffee? So whether that's a drip coffee, a cappuccino, a flat white, whatever. How would you take your coffee and why? Yeah. Ooh, that's a, it's a tough one, man. You gotta, you're picking from history and from everything. <laughs> everything. <laughs> I think it's like a, it's a gut thing too, you know, like I think you just kind of yeah. got to go with your gut on it. You know, and it's kind of, it's almost a weird one because I, I, I knew him pretty well and he's since passed on, but I would say Shane McConkie. Yeah. Um, he is one of the most legendary skiers of all time. He was my hero as a skier growing up. Um, he passed away uh, 10 years ago and uh, I still like hold his lessons and his spirit of skiing like pretty close to me. Yeah. And uh, I just would like you know, we wouldn't have any deep chats. We'd probably talk about like fart jokes and stuff. Cause that's the way he was. And he's like, yeah, a really yeah. unbelievably funny dude. But, um, I would just like, 
want to say hi to him again and yeah, hang no, out with awesome. him again. Um, that would be probably the guy I would have coffee with. Um, and then he'd probably proceed to make fun of me because I'm a, like a ski mountaineer now and he'd make fun of that <laughs> back in the day. So, right which would be perfect, which is exactly yeah. what I want out of the, uh, out of the chat. So, um, and as far as my coffee, like I am a, I'm a coffee snob. Um, okay. I'd, I love my coffee and it would have to be like kind of a single origin, well-roasted coffee from a, like a really good place. Most likely, I tend to like the Central American coffees my, my, are my favorite um, as opposed to African and Indi Indonesian. So Central American coffee, um, well-roasted and then just black. Uh, I don't right. like to mess with it if it's that good a coffee. And, do, you have, do you have a specific method then at this point? Because if you like it black, it's got to be a specific method, I'm assuming, right? Arrow yes. press, pour over, what is it? So I have two choice methods. Actually, I have three ways I actually do my coffee. And yeah, yeah. at home, I use a Mocha Master, um, oh, okay. which is really nice coffee maker. Yeah, it's yeah. pretty much like an automatic pour over, you know, perfect mm -hmm. temperature, wets the, wets the grounds in the perfect way. Um, you know, I have a good high quality grinder as well. And I get you know, good beans and whatnot. And yeah, the coffee just, it makes like, to me, the Mocha Master makes it taste like really good coffee house coffee, but at yeah, home. Um, for sure. So and whenever I travel, I definitely crave like getting home and drinking my Mocha Master coffee. Um, awesome. And then when I'm on the road, there's two ways, like AeroPress is pretty much what I do out of the back of my van, um, gives a good strong coffee and just be able to like add enough water to whatever you wanted, however you, um, want the strength to be. Um, so yeah, the arrow press is a good way. And then I also, you know, I have to resort. I, we do a lot of Alpine starts as we call them, which is waking up in the middle of the night, uh, anywhere from, you know, midnight, 11 at, I've woken up at 11 at night to start missions. Um, and then till like three in the morning. And in those mornings, I just, uh, I drink Alpine start coffee, which is an instant coffee, but it's a oh, good, really right good on. coffee company out of Boulder, Colorado. Yeah. And, uh, they make the best instant coffee I've found. So, so I, I, I couldn't definitely pass up drinking coffee on those days. So, but I, don't necessarily have the time to make like a nice good coffee so no, I get you. i'll just roll with an alpine start instant coffee no i get you no that's perfect man well, well thank you so much for jumping on like i said like it's it's been an honor to chat with you i did some research back uh when i first fell into the skiing world and man you're super decorated so for you to come on this podcast is is, is kind of an honor it's super cool and i'm glad to have you and guys if you want to check out the 50 project make sure you go down in the description below i'll also put a link to his truck he does like kind of a walkthrough as well as his cinematographer does a walkthrough through his van so we'll check that out as well so you be sure to check that out but other than that man we wish you nothing but safety and uh yeah best of luck well thank you very much for having me on